Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Avinash Singh talks about changing government policy so that we can all live longer. But first up, here's the news. Want to be undetectable? Researchers from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh can print glasses frames with visual textures that fool computer facial recognition systems, but which look like ordinary fashion eyewear to humans. Wearing the fashionably patterned spectacle frames can help you be wrongly identified as anyone in the system, even a celebrity you don't resemble, or fail to be identified at all. Over half the population of the United States are on facial recognition databases, and nations like Australia have pulled driver's licence and street surveillance facial recognition databases. While humans are unaffected by small changes to images, machines can be greatly affected. Machine learning image classification systems can be fooled by adding tiny amounts of random noise to their input. By selectively changing pixels in an image, it's possible to make changes that the computer can see and wrongly interpret, but humans barely notice. These are called adversarial examples. The researchers show that these can be transferred into a real-world security exploit by printing a specific random-looking pattern onto glasses frames. These patterns allow you to tune the noise to fool the facial recognition system into misidentifying you as a specific person who could be a different gender or ethnic background. By picking a pair of frames with large lens rims, the researchers were able to obscure about 6.5% of the pixels in any given facial picture. Printing a pattern over those frames was a way of manipulating the image of the face of the person wearing the glasses the researchers were able to print the pattern for just 22 cents per frame using a normal photo printer. They simply cut out the prints from the glossy photo paper and stuck them to regular glasses frames, a technique almost anyone could use. The researchers had two categories of attacks they wanted to explore. Impersonation, which is where you want to be wrongly identified as a specific other person. You could make it look like Edward Snowden is in 10 different locations at the same time. Dodging is where you want to be wrongly identified as anyone other than yourself in the system. This might be used by someone wanting to protect their privacy. They explored these two categories in three ways. Firstly, where a person who knows the inside of the facial recognition system can impersonate and dodge, with restrictions that make them even more hard to notice. Secondly, how someone who doesn't know the internals of a commercial facial recognition system can impersonate inconspicuously. And finally, how someone can be invisible to the most popular biometric face recognition algorithm, the Viola Jones Face Detector. This algorithm is popular because it's fast and accurate. The glasses were able to fool both commercial facial recognition software Face++ as well as a more specific model of software trained exclusively to recognise the five researchers and five celebrities. With just the pair of glasses on their faces, the researchers were able to successfully prevent the software from recognising their faces at all, as well as impersonate each other and celebrities, including Mila Jovovich and Carson Daly. By sticking the glasses frames onto photos, they were able to get the facial recognition system to misidentify Reese Witherspoon as Russell Crowe. They made an image of Kiefer Sutherland invisible to the facial recognition system using the Viola Jones face detector by adding plain white glasses and a hat, changing the pixels on his forehead and under his eyes. 
The researchers haven't tested the glasses in the real world yet. The researchers took photos in a room with no external windows to control the lighting. But they point out that many uses of facial recognition software, including biometric entry to a building, are limited in exactly the same way. You can try these out by reading the paper which was titled Accessorise to a Crime – Real and Stealthy Attacks on State-of-the-Art Face Recognition which was presented at the 2016 Computer and Communication Security Conference. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Would you like to be healthier for longer? October was Longevity Month. At the Bio Foundry, Avinash Singh spoke about how government policy could be changed to promote research into preventing and treating the diseases of old age. The process is so expensive and so long. For example, if you have one medicine and you want to approve it, you need to go through the FDA approval. And it takes a lot of money and around 10 to 20 years to approve a drug. Then you are able to use it. So it should need to be changed. Government start focusing only when uh, then some big player in this field like WHO, World Health Organization or European Commission and s similar organizations start focusing toward the problem. So if they are able to focus on the name of the problem, they are able to fund more money toward it. They can give you the funding for funding for cancer research, but not funding for aging. So you need a name. That's why I, I talking about the name. For example, someone's heart failure. There's, you, you already heard the news that there's an artificial heart available or artificial particular limb available, but you cannot use it. The reason is that government restricted toward it. You cannot use some special xenotransportation. So these are the problem with the aging. So if we can target this problem somehow, if we can promote this thing, lobbying the government more and more to think about this and add a policy in their policy thing, then maybe the more and more researcher will come out to do the aging research. Avinash is from the India Future Society and the International Longevity Alliance, activism for promoting longevity research. I began by asking Avinash, what are the problems longevity research faces that government policy can solve? So I would suggest that one of the biggest problem, aging is a very wide world. So nobody knows what is exactly aging. Aging is also one traditional thought, like people grow old and then die. That's also called aging. But what's the aging for research mean? That need to be defined. So they need to be defined that aging is something. They need to be defined that aging is a one kind of disease also. Maybe they can give us some name of this disease or maybe something else. But this should be a name, a very specific term for this aging world that, so that they can more focus on this particular term. And this is the word how, how everything works in this world. So we need to get the definition right so people understand what they're doing and why it's important. And so what's the next step? So after they define this term, I would also suggest that my, what the policy I'm suggesting is that more educational stuff should be out there to, so that people can learn and read more about the aging. What are the possible solutions out there? What is the possible approach could be there? What are the possible uh, people out there who can doing something like this? So this should be the second step. And this step only can come out when the government or policy maker also take further step. After defining the name of the dis aging problem, they should also define a particular department, particular group of people, particular um, committee, which further suggest 
what need to be do, what need to be uh, so resources provided the public so that they can do further research in the aging. For example, they can provide more funding resources, they can provide more resources and a program in the university and the college so that people can learn, study and can go more deeper in this particular science. So I think that's why this should be the second step. If they are able to do these two things, automatically you can further proceed in the third step where you are really treating with the aging stuff. Like you are really working toward the finding the cure for aging. Or finding the cure for aging, like I, uh, like I talk in that, uh, my presentation that there are several kinds of disease, but the main root cause of those diseases is the aging. So if you can prevent the aging, those diseases automatically prevent. And like if policy maker put this in the main policy, then pharmaceutical companies, which are the one of the biggest uh, funding agency, a big, biggest uh, something who are doing the research toward the cure disease and creating medicine, building the medicine, they can also do further things in this particular field. I think that. And if we can prevent the diseases of aging, for which aging is the biggest risk, then that saves an enormous amount of the budget of the government for looking after the elderly because they won't be getting frail and sick. That is true. That's a very good assumption. And that's true. When, when they are able to prevent the aging, for example, they got the just an assumption that they got one vaccination. We just hook up when you are young and the old age, you will not going to have those kind of problems. Of course, so lots of government in all around the world spending a lot of big budget of their amount is spending toward the aging not the aging so the health insurance and the health policy and here i'm just saying that aging can solve this all and they can also save some money which can invest in further in better life of the human and better life in research and further other kind of things so i think yeah that's a good assumption what you're talking about yeah. and what is longevity month so this is as per who world health organization this is this period of October is called as uh, old age month. This is the name of this thing. So they started this thing from several years ago. And all the longevity activists suggested that because this is the old age month, so why not we also call it longevity month and everyone should do something, some kind of activity to make people more aware about the longevity and aging and what's going on in the around the world. So that's why we celebrate this whole month by a different country, whatever they suggest uh, feels suitable for them and people organize little meetup, little group chatting, little presentation or whatever that's possible. So people do this thing to aware more and more people. We put the one specific day because, you know, if you make it more choice for the people, then maybe they confuse where, when, where. But this particular month can be more impact at the same time to whole world, wherever this event happens. So that's make more impactful and more awareness for the people. I think that that's why we choose this day yeah and so people should be reading about longevity and aging and talking about aging and the possibility that you can do something to slow down aging that's true that's true so that's what we awareness about it at least those people heard the aging word today they can go home and maybe google about the aging more and try to understand what is maybe it's more biological stuff maybe you cannot understand but still you get at least some overview and next time when you heard this word again or maybe when you your children talking about it so at least you can give him more view about your thinking rather than saying the traditional thing like i told before that everyone go get old and die but rather than you are saying this you can say maybe something else i hope this kind of awareness will go out other than that those are youngsters in, in, in this particular around the world who is listening to this kind of thing. They may be some kind of motivate toward this research because this is about them also. This is about their future. And they motivate themselves and maybe not them or maybe themselves, they push themselves to, uh, to volunteer toward more longevity research or maybe they start exploring this in more job prospects or maybe more toward the whatever they, I mean, it really can change their view and maybe help them to further explore the area. I, I think that that's, that's very helpful. Well, this is surely going to be the growth area in the very near future. As the world's population ages, we need to understand what's happening to people and how to make their lives better and make them less expensive. That's true. That's true. So it's, it's really helpful, like, like I told you. So I know there are lots of big research is going on around the world. Like uh, in the talk, there's one project called MMTP. So this is from our group. 
that's from our group what we are doing. So we just get the crowdfunding from the people itself and they funded about 60,000 to us and we just invested to the researcher. So the group we are in, we have lots of research in that and we are starting doing experiment with the mouse. And there are different approaches there are. There are one thing called telemers, there are another called celenotics, there are another things called uh, changing the young blood to old blood, something like that. So these are things are out there. And yeah, we are hoping that things are getting better. And actually, uh, there's a one woman called Liz Paris. She even did the first human in this earth, in all, on this earth that who did this on herself. Like she treated herself, rather than mouse or something, she treated herself with that kind of mechanism of aging. So she then proved that she could be a good example, a role model for the other researcher that, that this something is going on or something can be aging can help her. And maybe in future she will be a very, very huge example for the society that, yeah, see, it can be done, it can be work. It's not just a hypothetical thought or something. For the listeners, so Liz Parrish tried an experimental treatment that had previously only been proved to work in mice to lengthen her telomeres so that her cells were basically 20 years younger. And she's done that on herself and so far she seems to be healthy and cancer free but everyone's watching closely. That's true. So what she did is a very ethical step. But I think it's a need and it's, she takes further step to do this. It's also not for herself, it's also for the whole longevity society, whole longevity activists around the world. She did genome editing stuff to increase their telomeres age. And like you said, this can be going to increase her age by 20 years more. And she's basically from one organization called BioVia. So she's a CEO of that organization and she doing the research and she experimented herself. So that's very interesting. And that's why she was in the news from past uh, several months about, uh, she, she did experiment, if I'm not wrong, in the last year on herself. And then after that she's, but like I told you, government does not recognize that. And government say, no, it's not a solution because government have different policy and there's no policy for aging. And aging drug is not a drug like a, you have a migraine and you can have drug. It's something, it's not defined. It's not defined, so if you go to government for talking about it, so they don't know what is that, because it's not in the rule. They know by, but they know uh, himself, but they don't know by the rules. They cannot follow the rules and they cannot give you anything. They cannot support you. So that, that's the thing <laughs> around the world we are trying to approach and try to focus, try to target so that things are come up. And what does MMTP stand for? So MMTP is a major mouse testing program. So it's a, uh, like in the talk we're talking about, it's a, another kind of aging process. We're trying to target the mouse because we think that this is really simple and specifically focused research we can do and can find out the cure. And after that, uh, what's our big goal is that after we do this for first three years, it's to, going to take the three years to finally we confirm that, okay, yeah, this is going on. Because this research is very sensitive as well. So we need to be very careful and we need to repeat several trials to say, yes, it's working. And after we do that three years project of MMTP, what's called Major Mouse Testing Program, we're going to do it on the human. That's why our target. But yeah, let's hope for best. So I would just suggest that, that try to think more about the aging. Aging is not just something a traditional word is more than that. It's more biological process. It's more about science. It's more about technology. It's not something you can think that it's going to happen. It's nature. Yeah, it's nature, and we already change a lot of things in the nature. Already it's a science. You can see that. Aging also can be defeated the same way. We can do something toward the anti-aging. We can avoid this problem for the old age. Think about the loved ones you have that you, you have your children and you want that, even you get old, you can take care of them, you can see them, you are, because they are loved ones for you. But you, after a particular age, you die. But if with the help of the aging, you can avoid this thing. With the help of aging, you can avoid lots of things. You can go with a further ambitious dream if you can solve the aging. So please keep promoting it, keep advocating it, keep supporting it, idea, and also keep sharing it toward the other people so that people and community get more and more understanding about this this, th this thing and maybe it will help in some couple of years. I hope that people are more aware about this problem and 
policy maker will come up with some solution. I hope so. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Avinash Singh from the India Future Society and International Longevity Alliance, talking about changing government policy to promote research into being healthier for longer. Avinash's personal research is into engineering brain-computer interfaces at the University of Technology, Sydney. I'll be talking to him about that in a future episode. And now some comments from listeners about autonomous vehicles and their ethics. Dalton from the US thoughtfully wrote, The obvious approach to this dilemma is that the auto manufacturers should provide a selection of choices with regard to moral questions involving potential danger to the public and private owners as preferential configuration parameters. Before the self-driving mode can be engaged, it should require the driver to set the preferred parameter as default, one that could be changed by the driver at any time. This would transfer both the liability and moral decision to the driver and away from the manufacturer. This helps address one of the issues I didn't really cover that well in the story last week, which is what happens with the insurance. Who is responsible for the car also means not just morally, but legally. And if the driver is choosing what happens to the car, then the driver would be responsible. And from Australia, with his tongue firmly in his cheek, Gary wrote on Facebook, Wonderful episode, Ian. Off to Colombia to get my telomere extension and to get away from those rogue self-cars. Makes me think of the Stephen King film called Christine, if you remember that one. I suspect pedestrians will be detected by cars not only visually, but through their phone, watch or implant, and the likelihood of accident will be very small. Thank you, Dalton, and thank you, Gary. And finally, here's some 24 7 lectures from the Annals of Improbable Research, the journal of science that first makes you laugh and then makes you think. And now get set for something special the 24 7 lectures. We have invited several of the world's top thinkers to tell us very briefly what they're thinking about. Each 24 7 lecturer will explain her or his topic twice. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds, and then after a brief pause, a clear summary, that's a clear summary, that anyone can understand in seven words. The 24 second time limit will be enforced by our referee, Mr. John Barrett. Mr. Barrett, uh, do you have any advice for our 24 seven lecturers? Gentlemen, keep it clean. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Let's have the first group of 24-7 lecturers. The first 24-7 lecture will be delivered by 1993 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine, Rich Roberts. His topic, clock genes. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. The original circadian locomotive output cycles caput or clock gene encodes a basic helix loop helix pass transcription factor called clock that is one of a family of genes that control circadian rhythm in mammals. More than 20 genes are involved with such catchy names as period and cryptocomb. The products of many of them are activated on others in success. And now a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven Words On your mark, get set, go. Clock genes are responsible for jet lag. <laughs> you can find more Improbable research at www.improbable.com. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your own voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. And listen up, because there will be some more people contributing stories in the coming weeks. Send your contributions, opinions, congratulations, standing ovations, helpful suggestions, and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear 
more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Check out the Patreon page, patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the community radio network, including 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambaka Valley, and 3 MBR in the Malay border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation Science 360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.